Hi, everyone. I'm Shaheen from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here with Christine Kuyugan, a growth marketing consultant based in Barcelona. Thanks so much for joining us, Christine. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So you recently made the move from Austria to Spain. Can you tell us what prompted you to do that, especially in this strange year? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, like, it's a bigger story, right? So let me introduce myself. So yeah, I'm Christine. I'm actually originally from the Philippines. Um, I moved to Austria in 2014 to work for a company called Adidas Fantastic. They're one of the leading health and fitness apps. Um, and yeah, and in the beginning of this year, um, after working for them for almost six years, uh, I thought that it would be great to actually have a change and to to start my career in a new country again. And also like with the new country country I have to really emphasize Barcelona in Spain because like of two reasons Barcelona is such a big tech hub for people like me who are mobile app marketers um, and also the second and bigger reason is the great weather so Barcelona is super known for the beaches and everything and I'm and me coming from the Philippines like that just was a no-brainer for me I'm like if I had the chance to move here I definitely would. And I was happy to actually have had that. Uh, although it was, let's say, as you said, really weird timings right now. <laughs> yeah, but you actually came like a little bit before the pandemic started, I guess. Or not before it started, but before the lockdown situation happened. Yeah, just a little bit before that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I at least like had a few good weeks of like seeing Barcelona with like people and events. But yeah, but even though like we are kind of in a really weird situation, not just Spain, but everyone in the world, um, I think it's still a really great place to live, a really nice uh, city to be in. And, and this is coming from someone who's even new just this year. Yeah, who's like only really experienced it during <laughs> during this strange time. So imagine how great it will be afterwards, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so you actually came to Barcelona with with the idea of starting your own consulting business, right? So how's it, what's it been like starting this business during, during a pandemic? <laughs> well, okay. Let's say it was a bit rocky roads because of all the offices being closed. Because me coming from the Philippines, like it wasn't easy to just like move, you know, like there are papers, there are documents, there are bureaucracies I've had to, to like, let's say pass. So that didn't come as I wanted it to be, but I have to say, like, I think that's part of the journey as well, because like it is a privilege to be here and to have had that opportunity. So let's say if that was the work that I needed to do to actually live the life that I want and I'm living now, um, that was OK. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that was really a little bit harder just because there was a pandemic. So I can remember like the the immigration office was closed for at least two months uh, back in March. And then the, the social security offices weren't taking any physical appointments. You, you would have needed like a digital certificate, but me being new here didn't have a digital certificate. So there was a lot of these things that were going on. But again, like I think now that I've passed it, now that it's settled, <laughs> um, I would really have to say it was still worth it because I really like the, the fact that I'm able to establish this business to be a growth marketing consultant because now I can pick up projects that I really like with products and companies I really want to, to contribute uh, on their growth marketing on. Yeah, so can you tell us what does it mean to be a, a growth marketing consultant? What do, you, what, do you, what do you focus on? What do you offer your clients? Yeah, so actually I'm very focused on mobile apps. So my experience also back in Austria and also like my studies was all geared about um, app store marketing and also like paid user acquisition when it comes to mobile apps. So actually I always tell my, let's say older friends, if you ask me anything about the web, I'll be like, oh, I have no idea. Like how does that even work kind of like scenario. But that's okay because actually I have found that niche in, in mobile app marketing um, and also like mobile is the, the way to go for a lot of like, like industries moving forward. Like they need to have a mobile strategy. So let's say, yeah, it, it was an opportunity um, that I think like back in 2014, if I rethink it, like how I come, ac how I come across to the mobile app marketing world, I have to say it was just because I found a, a spot that was open. And nobody was like, let's say, you know, really interested in it. Um, and I and I gave it a chance. Um, and I think that was the best, like, let's say, unknown um, what is going to happen in that uh, pathway for me decision that I ever made. Because I wasn't 
actually like really deciding to myself, yeah, yeah, I will go to mobile app marketing. But I stumbled across an opportunity that made me start my career there. And I've been loving it ever since. Yeah, very cool. So so that w- was Runtastic your first experience there or okay, that w- that was the yes, opportunity, exactly. right? So you've actually yeah. you worked for some really cool companies. You worked with Runtastic for 6 years like you said. Um now I one of your clients is a language learning app called Drops. Um so was, so you're working with some really cool startups that are doing more in like the consumer space so kind of like fun kind of content. What have you learned in these roles um in these in these fast growing startups in terms of user acquisition and marketing? Yeah. I mean, like, I think with content and mobile, there's one thing that you will always have to keep in mind, and that's to fail fast. (laughs) I don't know, this might sound really weird uh, to some of our listeners here, but the thing is that when you're trying to sell a mobile app, you will always have a lot of features in an app. And you'll never know what really resonates with the audience unless you A-B test all of them. And I can tell you there's so many things you can A-B test when you're working with mobile apps. So that's why like the best learning I had for me was the fail fast thing. Because like I think in the beginning when I was starting out on it, I was always super afraid to, 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 to recommend, oh, can we try this direction? Because I think blah, blah, blah. But I've completely removed that from my mindset and always just come up with hypotheses of what I think would work well as content and always test it. And it doesn't matter if I think like, um, yeah, this idea doesn't make sense. I'm like, maybe it doesn't make sense to you, but unless we actually have the numbers to prove that, um, we won't know for sure. So I think that's the, the, the main thing that I've learned in all of these companies that I worked for is that, yeah, test everything. Fail fast, but learn from it. And and then from there, iterate on what works best. So, so this fail fast kind of comes from that uh, lean startup methodology, right? Yeah. Okay. So w- you mentioned, I mean, you're a specialist in, in app store marketing. Can you share any tips and tricks for getting an app at the top of search in, in the app store? Yeah. So with app store optimization, honestly, there's a lot of things that you have to keep in mind. But the main thing, to be honest is to really know Apple and Google because actually like they have different rules that you will have to have different strategies how to get to the app, to the top of the app store when it comes to Apple search and when it comes to the Google search because, okay, it's like two big companies that do not agree on how things should work, right? And that's fine because they're two completely different companies. But that makes you um, as the content manager, as the ASO manager, to know what these differences are. So just to give you like maybe a couple of tricks, right? On Apple, um, it doesn't work when you repeat keywords, which is a lot of SEO managers will be thinking, but that's counterintuitive. But actually, the fact is that Apple, in Apple, you only have a couple of characters that you can optimize on when it, when it comes to keyword um, marketing. So you're going to have to really choose what keywords you would want to promote, what keywords you would like to, to rank for. So and, and by a couple of characters, I really mean it like it's super small content. So it's like 30 characters for the title of your app. 29 characters for your subtitle. I mean, normally it's 30, but there's like a bug that's been going on for a while now. And then you have a keywords field, which is just 100 characters. So when you think about this, when you're trying to get an app um, on the Apple App Store on the top of the search, you have a total of 159 characters. So how in the world are you going to put up so much content, so much of your ideas, so much of the keywords that are could make sense for your app in 160 characters. So that's the main, like, let's say, trick on Apple because you have to fight the, ba- the battles that you think you can win um, and also the, the keywords that you think will really bring in the, the correct um, consumers to find your app. On Google, it's the exact opposite. <laughs> so on Google, iteration and repetition of keywords is a really important thing because that's what Google takes as, um, let's say, a, a factor on what they believe you believe is important for your app. But they're also really strict on spamming. So if they see that the app is using this keyword too much times and you know it doesn't even make sense in the metadata, they're actually going to think that as a keyword spamming or a keyword um, um, iteration that is not in a in a good linguistic way so they're not going to even try so with these two app stores 
as well, like aside from these differences in rules, how to do that, you have to know that they change. It's not like there's a dynamic rule or sorry, a static rule um, that, yeah, this will forever be the way. That's not the case because actually over the years, I think like at least they have changed the mechanism of how search works at least two or three three times in the last two years, for example. So you always have to be aware of these changes. Um, and also like, again, with the fail fast thing, um, there are a lot of things that you can test um, or A-B test in, an, in a mobile app store listing. So with the, with the limited things that you could do, you should still try to do that though. Absolutely. So this is like a, a, I guess, a novice question because I have no experience with app store marketing. But besides optimizing, I mean, the description of the app itself, like what else goes into what else goes into it? Because I mean, what other types of content do you need to create? Like what? Yeah. What are the other aspects of your job? Yeah. So. So, yeah, actually, you're, you're completely right. I, can, uh, I haven't mentioned to you the the other part of app store marketing, which is also the creative um um, visual um, optimization. So when you're looking into new apps on your phone um, and just think about it, like, okay, maybe you're not the kind of person who reads descriptions, right? Because like, well, who reads it? Who has time for that? There's all, um, the, the, the great thing is that in the app stores, you will always also have the, the possibility to come across your uh, product through screenshots or even app preview uh, or promotion videos. So these two types of content, um, can, you can always have a million ideas on how to design it and also how to really um, understand what resonates the most with your, um, with your audience. And from that, you can actually really, with your content in this case, the visual content, you can, um, you can create a cycle of optimization that brings you more in users because like the more people sees your app because of your, let's say, searched uh, keywords or your ranked keywords, and then they land to your page. And then you have to convince them in, let's say, less than three seconds that your app is worthy to be downloaded in their phone. And the best way to do that, under the assumption they don't read, <laughs> is the screenshots and the videos that are going to be present for the app itself in the stores. So on that side, the creatives, um, I think like, it's it's already the end of the year, and honestly, I have no idea how much A/B tests I've ran to to and how many ideas that uh, that the team has created in order to really um, come to a conversion rate where we say, oh, okay, this is this is good. We we can still keep trying to make it better, and that's always the also the the thought that you should have in mind, even though I don't know, like you see that you're ten percent more than you were last year. You can never get um, high, uh, too high, let's say. <laughs> so how do you A-B test in the App Store when you only have like one listing to work with? Okay, so on Apple, I have to say it's a little bit more complicated because you will have to include some Facebook pages to create some ads and everything. So I'll tell you the, the way that a lot of marketers do it as well. On Google, it's easier because on their platform itself, there's the Google A-B test experiments, which wherein you can test all of these um, creatives that I mentioned to you. So like if you have an idea for um, for what kind of screenshots you want, you can create like three to four variants of these um, screenshots. And then you can really have uh, the, 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 the segment of new users be segmented in equally parts or even if you or if you're actually risk adverse. You can say that you want 50% in the normal store listing that I know works, okay? Um, because maybe your idea is too radical and you're, mm, okay, I don't want to, to decline so he uh, so heavily if my idea is bad. Uh, you can also do that in Google. Um, okay, so they have like yeah, a built-in so tool for that, basically. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And this built-in tool, like normally it's, I, I would say like there are, there are going to be two opinions. Like some marketers like believe that, okay, they test it on Google and then they apply it on Apple and see how it works on Apple. Because as I said, like on Apple, A-B testing is a little bit hard. I'm actually hoping that they would have a similar solution soon. I'm, I'm sure that they're actually working on something similar, hopefully. But yeah, but that's one way to go. And the other way to go is really to go through that complicated process of trying to find out how it works for Apple with the Facebook pages, as I mentioned to you. But yeah. And then once you've kind of like figured it out and you've you've got the final answer, is that it? Is your job done? Or 
what happens after that. Never done. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the cool thing, right? That's why, like, uh, our clients, um, for everyone who's working in this space, like, there is always something you can improve. Um, even if you really hit the target of your client, you can still say, hmm, but we haven't tested this part. What if this part also still brings in this much improvement? And whenever this, when you think about it, like, if you're working for a huge app, right? A 5% increase in conversion rate, it sounds small, right? It sounds small, yeah, yeah. But when you think about the traffic that these apps are getting, a 5% increase is more than enough to actually really bring in a lot of revenue um, that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten because you didn't make that improvement. So when it comes to this kind of content uh, testing on apps, I think, my job, our job is never done because there's always going to be things that you can test. And also on the, on the other point, as I mentioned, they're always changing this. So actually, let's say there are some apps that if they do not really take care of it, um, they will decline at some point because other companies are might be more successful in testing the ideas they have and then they overtake you. Let's say like it's always an ongoing process. As long as your app is out there, as long as you would like to 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 have users see it, our job as a as an ASO or even like as a growth marketing uh, consultant, um, it will never be over. Yeah, I see. It's good for me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and I imagine like the apps themselves are also evolving, so the, so it has to kind of reflect what's the re- most recent features and all that kind of stuff, right? Exactly. Well, I mean, could you share any example of? Uh, I, I usually ask about a piece of content. I guess in your case, well, it would be an app store listing, no? <laughs> that worked really well or a tactic that you used with content that worked really well and why you think that was? Okay. I think like the biggest test that I've done has always been with videos because like, again, this is about how consumer um, uh, consumers are reacting to creatives right now. Uh, when it comes to content, like the the faster you capture their attention and the faster you're able to really um, promote a value proposition of your feature, um, the better. So when I, when, so it's not, this doesn't just apply to the app store listings. This also applies to ads, right? So if you're a growth marketing manager that also um, uh, invests in, uh, in social ads on Facebook, on Instagram, so on and so forth, um, you will quickly realize that video is an amazing type of content that you can use to really um, um, communicate to the users in, an, in a fast way what your app is about. So the one tests are the, not the one test, the one uh, idea that you need to test is value prop testing in the first three seconds of a video. So when you also look at like, or just, you know, imagine yourself, right? When you're on your phone, when you're looking into your news feed on Instagram or Facebook, you're normally just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling away. And unless something really ca- catches your eye, you will not really like um, put your time into even looking what it was. So that's why like whenever I'm doing some um, content testing, and this is like really the, the reason why I, this is what really worked well for me. Um, I always tested what was going to be in that first three seconds under the assumption that, okay, if they never go through the first three seconds, will they know that the app is about this and that it's, uh, and it's the best um, app for this reason. So like, let, let's say um, just an example for, give me an app that you, that you really like uh, Shaheen so that I can give you maybe some <laughs> idea how to, <laughs> how to, to test there. Like to do is it's a to do list app. <laughs> Okay, so if you're working for a to-do list app, what are the value props that you can say? Well, first of all, there's going to be the, the good um, checklist, um, you know, how to manage your tasks in a good way. The second thing would be maybe you have a calendar um, that you can um, put the deadlines on, on your task. And the third thing may be, I don't know um, how, to, how to say this, but like it's also a, a value prop in itself that the app is making your life more organized. So there are three ideas that I just came up with in my head right now. And when you're putting it in a video, obviously you cannot say all these three things in the first three seconds, right? Like, or maybe you're a genius, you can, I don't know. (laughs) But in general, like with these three thoughts that you have, test them, right? Because then you will understand, okay, I launched these ads that is um, the first one being dedicated to the list itself. 
The second one being dedicated to having a deadline or calendar for my task. And the third one for just really saying, making your life more organized with a, with a, with a list app. So from there, I don't know what will work best, to be honest, but you can test that. And when you do, you will understand that, okay, making their lives more organized was the one that had the most clicks and also then the, the one that had the most um, app downloads on my end. So the conversion rate was really high. So I would recommend that you use this direction in your future ways of selling the app. Wow, that's yeah, super interesting, the whole process that goes behind that. And definitely has some parallels to web marketing for sure, but it's so sp- specific, right, with the, with the app store. And there sounds like there's a lot of inter- intricacies you need to be familiar with. So super cool. Well, thanks for sharing your insights on that. And I, I wanted to... I also go back to your your personal story and about your move to Spain because I know a lot of our a lot of people in our community live in Spain or are thinking about moving to Spain because we're based in Spain. So I was I was just curious if you have any advice about making that leap. Well, advice. <laughs> I mean, okay. I think like moving to Spain was my best decision this year. Even though there's COVID, even though it was hard, like we had one of the strictest lockdowns ever. My birthday was actually April 23, which in Catalonia, I don't know if it's in the entire Spain, it is the case. It's the Sant uh, Juan. Uh, there's a, this feast wherein like in the streets, there would be a lot of these bookshops and people giving roses to girls. And I'm like, oh man, I, I miss this because like, you know, there was a hard lockdown during this day. And again, like despite all of these things that really happened, I think it was worth it. Also, all of the bureaucracy and those hoops that I had to join, it was still worth it. So when you're looking for a certain lifestyle, which is, let's say, having a good weather, and I'm looking outside right now, it's super sunny, it's 21 degrees later on, it's the middle of November. If that's a lifestyle that you're looking for, um, so for example, me, I go to lunch break at the beach, I know it's going to be hard, and there are a lot of things that will maybe discourage you. But if you have a good plan on what you're going to be doing when you're, when you're based here, so for example, for me, of course, I had to make sure I have clients and everything, um, that would be okay that I'm based here. Um, and second of all, you're looking for this kind of lifestyle, then honestly, forget about all of those, what if, how can I do this? Just do it, really. Because like, I think it will be worth it. It will be hard. But if it's something that you think you really want to do and you see that, this is possible. This is not like a something that will take me 10 years to do. I would honestly say, why not? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. You can make it work somehow, right? If you really want it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point. So I wanted to ask you about some of your recommendations. First of all, if you have a, a favorite Ooh. app at the moment yourself. <laughs> Too good to go. I don't know if you know the app. I, I have heard of it. Yeah, it's they're from the Netherlands, right? I've, I've definitely heard about the about the company. I haven't used the app myself, but right. Yeah, no, I, I like supporting their their costs actually. So what they do is that they they partner with restaurants and um, and even supermarkets sometimes. And at the end of the day, so there's going to be like a certain period when these shops closes, they put the, the, the things that the restaurant or the shop wasn't able to sell for the day for a cheaper price so that it won't go to waste. And I love it because like food waste is a big problem in the world. I think every one of us is aware of that. And any cost that supports that, obviously, I'm, I would recommend the really, really good and the reason why they're my favorite app at the moment is obviously i'm using them a lot of times now (laughs) because there's not a lot of restaurants open but still at the end of the day when they have um when they have overproduced what they think could uh they would need for the deliveries that would happen during the day um i would like to to rescue them and again like there's actually a lot of really cool restaurants that participate so for example like i have really um there's a pizza place that i really love and it's awesome because like normally the pizzas are like, I don't know, eight, nine euros. But because of this, like, you know, it's the end of the day. Um, there's there's a chance that it will just be put to waste. It becomes like three euros. So when I think about it, I'm like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I didn't actually know they were operating in Spain. So I'll definitely have to check that out. <laughs> but I've, I've read like news about that company. So that's very cool. Yeah. Um, 
Well, and then I wanted to ask if you recommend any marketing related group or publication. Uh, on group, yeah, there's a couple on Slack actually. So there's ASO and Mobile Growth Stack from Feature. They're a big company in uh, in Germany. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, mobile app marketers there, um, which is pretty good um, because like we're always more than um, happy to share some insights and knowledge uh, amongst each other. And also there's the Mobile Growth Heroes from Lift Off. There's Grow.co, um, which is, again, it's very focused on mobile uh, marketing, but they are all really good sites, especially when you want to connect with uh, mobile marketers. Mm-hmm. I see. So it sounds like you're very active in a lot of different groups. <laughs> oh, cool. I am. Yeah. I have like a million Slack channels. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I guess in, in your role, it's really important to like be really up to date, right, on what's going on uh, in the latest. Exactly. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, speaking of, I mean, do you also recommend any learning resources or online courses to, like, keep fresh on, on things? With the online courses, I mean, like, there's actually the great thing about mobile marketing is that the the platforms that where you can do mobile marketing, they also offer their own courses. So, for example, Facebook offer Blueprint courses. They are completely free. You can do them at your own pace, at your own time. And I think it's very useful. There's also Google Digital Garage. Again, completely free. If you want a certificate, I think it costs something. But if you just really want to learn, um, it's completely um, available, uh, again, on your own time. Um, There's also the, I think Apple even just released a new one last month, um, which is the Apple Search um, um, courses. So there's a lot of these like um, good uh, material, the platforms where different contents exist as you can imagine because in Facebook there are different formats on content on Google they're different and Apple is completely different as well um, so you'd, you'd have to know how each platform works and and it's really great that they offer these learning resources because like if I don't have the chance to actually work on them so you know I have clients that have apps so that's why I'm really working on this day on day if I didn't had this chance I think like I wouldn't have any good source of information aside uh, from these um, courses and free by the way because there's a lot of courses which like okay it's it's great uh, <laughs> however it's always paid and I think like especially if you're starting out if you're out of university like I was when I first started I, I, I didn't have the, the money to actually invest um, on, on courses that would be useful but it's just that it's yeah, it was quite expensive let's say. <laughs> Yeah, and it also makes sense, like you're saying, to get the information directly from the source if if you're going to specialize in working with those with certain platforms, like take yeah. the course from the platform itself. It makes sense. Which, by the way, I, I didn't even ask you about paid search, but I guess that's part of, of what you consult on as well. So it's not only yeah. the app stores, but also bringing people to the app stores through other tools, right? Okay. Yes. Cool. Well, going into your other recommendations, do you, do you recommend any marketing or business book? Well, actually... I have a book recommendation. It's not completely just about marketing. It's called Swipe to Unlock. Actually, it's bit-sized stories of why things are the way they are in the business world. So like, for example, why does Tinder offer this for free? Or why does Google do this and that? Because there's actually reasons like, uh, you know, like, and they're very interesting stories. Like, it's not like that you would learn anything that you can implement tomorrow or something but it's great to read because you'll understand the logic behind why things are the way they are right now in terms of the tech companies that are really huge right now so there's a lot of stories from airbnb there were stories about why kodak failed for example so you'll you'll have a lot of oh, okay that's cool and and having that context also maybe it um it helps you avoid the mistakes um, that those companies did when they had that thought or so on and so forth. So that's cool. That's a really good book. I, I really recommend it. That's a great recommendation. And then your best productivity hack. Well, I, I can tell you my hack, but I don't know if it's going to be applicable for everyone here unless they move to Spain. <laughs> um, is that like every morning I do try to, <laughs> hopefully when there's no lockdown, uh, I do some morning beach coffee walks. So I take my coffee, which I have like here now. (laughs) Um, And I really just walk there because it's so calming and it's giving me the correct mood to start my day right. 
Um, and then after that, I do a 10-minute self stand-up. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but I need to organize what I want to do for the rest of the day. And it's very useful when, when you have that because it helps you not go off track, let's say. So that's what I, I do. And I think with that, like, it, it makes my day. You started right because you're happy. You got the beat. There was really good sun in your face. And then you think about, okay, this is what I'm going to be achieving until the end of the day. So, yeah. So I haven't heard that term self stand up. Is that like a thing or <laughs> it's your term? <laughs> it's my term. It's just that like uh, I work alone, right? I'm a consultant. So normally if you have a stand up, it's with your team or with people. Uh-huh. But like if it's just you, like, okay, how do you do that? Like, should I bother my neighbors? Hey, let's think about, let's brainstorm what I need to do today. No. So that's why like I call it self stand up because it's actually just me prioritizing, but also like really saying it out loud. Or actually I have a, okay, I don't know if I can show it. I have a board here with the, the with the post-its of what I need to do. And then I move them throughout the day when I'm finished um, because it is really, really important, especially when you have clients that have time-based deadlines, right? So you need to have a good overview of that. Yeah, that's a super interesting concept. You should write something about it. You can start a trend there. <laughs> I like it. So it's like having your daily huddle meeting, your stand-up meeting but yeah. by yourself, right? I like that. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Me and my personalities. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, uh, so we're, we're reaching the end of the interview. So I just wanted to give you the chance to give us any final parting advice or takeaways for other content marketers or marketers across Europe. Um, well. It is cliche, but it is true what they say about content, that it is king. It is the queen. <laughs> it is what is making gonna, what is going to make you stand out in a world that is fast-paced, in a world that is, let's say, it is more and more based on algorithms, what can be shown in the feed and everything. Content that is relevant to your audience and not just, let's say, you know, because you have a sale or anything, but really purposeful content is what resonates the most. And in depending on what industry you work for, you will have a lot of ideas what this purposeful content would be for your industry. But yeah, as I said earlier, you should test that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the <laughs> the mix of the analytical and the creative that gives the best results, right? Yes. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Christine, for sharing your insights with us today. You're welcome. As I said, like I'm super happy to be in the show. Like. I feel like I'm an insider in Spain now with the <laughs> for being here. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you are. Well, thank you again for, for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out thecontentmix.com and keep tuning into the podcast for daily interviews with content experts. See you next time. Bye, Christine. <laughs> Bye.